Hello, everyone, and welcome to a new and improved episode of Limited Time Only. It's episode 28? 28. Yeah. yeah. You know that? I do. How do you know that? Well, we have so few numbers, it's easy to keep track of. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's episode 28. I'm joined by Drew. What's up, Drew? Oh, nothing much. Um, Got to play some Magic over the last week. Pre-release. Did a couple drafts. I did so, so many drafts. I did two, which is quite a bit more than me for usual on a given week. So, yeah, for me, it's a lot. Yeah, I took Thursday off, and we drafted all day. So, the Thursday before the set came out. Yeah, I kind of wish I would have gotten, like, uh, an extra draft in on one of the days, but um, no dice. All right. Well, let's uh, let's get right into this. This week, we're doing our common set reviews. So Drew and I each pick three cards that we believe are the best commons for each color, and we're going to talk about them and kind of compare lists. Uh, let's go on to... Uh, don't forget to check out the podcast on puremtgo.com and mtgotraders.com. Uh, MTGO Traders is a great place to... Buy the magical magical cards for online. It's a great place. You can check them out. Uh, don't forget that you can su- support the Constructed Criticism family directly by going to patreon.com slash ccmtg. Uh, eventually, we'll pay Drew lots of dollars and me lots of dollars and do the show every week and stuff like that, and that would be great. <laughs> so uh, if you are interested in this show, check out the, uh, the other show, the Constructed Criticism, and don't forget to check out the YouTube channel. But let's go into our first segment, Pick... Two, where uh, we picked a card, and we have to decide where to go from here for the next two picks in the draft. Um, So, Drew, our first pick was Arlen Cord. Oh, that's pretty awesome. Yeah, it is. It is awesome. (laughs) We're so lucky, but but uh, our pack is. Vessel of Vitality, so that's the enchantment for two mana that you can sacrifice to two mana to make four mana. I don't think we're about that card. Uh, no, I don't. I yeah, I don't think I'm ever gonna play that card like ever. So, <laughs> just the wind is next. It's one blue and one for an instant. Return target creature to its owner's hand. It has mana for blue. This card was great for me. Yeah, this card's uh pretty good. Not quite as good as Silent Departure in the last Innistrad set, but definitely, I think, much better than most... Like, More fun ones. than Silent Departure. Yeah, and it, it and it's much better than most normal unsummon effects. So I, th- I think this is like a top-notch blue common. Uh, next up, we have Sanguary Mage. That's one red and one for a 1-3. It's a vampire wizard, and it has prowess. Uh, just a curve filler. Certainly not a second pick. Uh, next, we have Intrepid... Provisioner, it's three and a green for a human scout as trample. It's a three three. And when it enters the battlefield, another target human you control gets plus two plus two until end of turn. I'm usually a really weak fan of these cards, but I also really like them to have flash. Well, yeah, I mean they're much stronger. They're like a two for one when they have flash. Um but this guy's still okay in like a dedicated humans deck. Even then it's if you can pump a guy and get a three three out of it, it's fine. But again, it's a little bit more of a curve filler, not really a second pick card. The next card we have is Rancid Rats. It's one black and one for a one one zombie rat. It has Skulk and Death Touch. This card has actually just been great for me. It's like been I actually would pick this card over throttle, I think, at this point. Uh, yeah, I can definitely see that. Um, this card is quite good. Death Touch Rats tend to be pretty good and limited. Um, they're also, I think, incidentally good in this set because there's so many werewolves running around. So yeah. having, like, a creature that can actually trade with, like, a 5-6 or something is pretty good. Yeah, and Skulk has been better than I thought it would be. And it also made other cards that are good against Skull creatures better than I thought they would be. Mm-hmm. Uh, Vessel of... Uh, I don't know how to say this word. Megality? Malignity, like <laughs> Malignity. It's the black one. The black one. Uh, mal- yeah, mal- malign- malignity. Malignity. That's the word. Thank we'll, you. We'll go with that. I don't know if that's right, but <laughs> it's one black and one for an enchantment. You can sacrifice it for a black and one, and the target opponent exiles two card from his or her hand. This card is very good against me in the sealed pre-release. Um, but I don't know. I don't know that I've been that impressed with that outside of that. I mean, it's it's still good. It's just it lets you use you know splitting the cost for four is definitely. I, it might be better than three. I'm not sure. 
Um, you can only I, cast it when you can do a sorcery, so it's not like you can get them. Yeah, I think it's a little bit worse than, like, a conventional Mind Rot. It does have the benefit of exiling the cards, so they won't ever get Madness off yeah. of it, or Delirium. But, um, yeah, I think this is generally just, like, kind of a... a, a just really back-end filler. Yeah, and it's really it's really only going to be okay and sealed, where maybe they have a top-end bomb-heavy deck, and you want to be able to um, strip their cards out of their hand. Sure. Um, I, I definitely, I, I played it in my pre-release deck, and to be honest, it was kind of underwhelming for me. I uh, felt that way in draft, and I've never played with it out, like, I didn't play with it in sealed, but it was good against me in sealed, but it could have just been good in that moment, not that good of a card. Yeah, I, honestly, I think instead of playing that in my main deck, I should have been playing, um, what is the name of the card? Uh, Grotesque Mutation. That card that has been sideboard. so good for me. Yeah, the, so, in, because my, my deck was winning primarily off the back of Flyers, and I ended up racing a lot, so I think Grotesque Mutation would have been much better than trying to randomly make them discard cards or whatever, so... Byway Carrier is next. It's two and a green for a three-two human scout. Whenever it when it dies, investigate. Uh, this is a great green creature. Um, the stats are pretty good on their own. Like if three-two for three is passable, it's solid. Um, not super exciting, but the fact that when this dies, it uh, gets you a clue is great. Um, I also I think I actually like it even a little bit better than the three-three for four. That when it deals combat damage, you generate a clue that guy has a lot of upside right like if you enchant him or get him with a combat trick you can generate a lot of card advantage that way but i find myself just being able to remove that guy with removal uh I, is it briar ridge patrol is the name of the other card i'm thinking of um anyways the point is is that byway courier is slightly cheaper and if they kill him you still get a clue regardless so next we have magmatic chasm uh it's a reprint i don't think i'm taking that this early um all three of our uncommons are good, though. We have, uh, I don't know how good this one is, but it's good. It's I don't, I'm not sure how good. It's uh, Erdwall Illuminator. It's one blue and one for a one three spirit. Whenever you investigate for the first each time, uh, uh, for the first time each turn, and do it additional time. Um, this card is great in the clue based synergy decks, which Aaron Maranaka drafted every single time I did a draft with him. He had Tamio's Journal in both of his decks. <laughs> what a uh, cheater. And and he had that creature in both of his decks. So in those kind of decks, uh it's great. Um one three flyers for two are pretty pretty reasonable rate as well. So I like this guy a lot. Um I may be hoping to get something a little bit more powerful and a little bit more impactful, but I could definitely see possibly taking this guy and maybe trying to go for a clue deck, um, even though we took Arlen Cord, which obviously doesn't fit at all in a clue deck. So Next up we have Ghoul Steed. It's four and a black for a four four zombie horse. You can pay three, so two and a black to discard two cards and return it from the battlefield tapped. This card actually was good for me. Um it's okay. I, I thought I it would be bad. Yeah, I don't think it's bad. I just don't think it's that great. I, I think it's a, just a kind of a mediocre creature. Okay. Um, it's just like, you know, you play it. Um, it doesn't it doesn't really have a huge impact. The card that impressed me a lot more was the 3-1 flyer for four that you can pitch. That card is good. Play. And that card's very powerful. I think, I think it's much... It, it's definitely on a much higher, like, different class of Gold yeah. Seed. Gold Seed is a card that, like I said, I'm willing to play it, but... The awkward thing is I want, a lot of times in my black decks, I want Madness Outlets, and this card is kind of awkwardly not a Madness Outlet a lot of times. A lot of times it's just a 4-4 four, four for 5, and you're like, eh, not the greatest. So it's fine. I mean, I, I, I like I said, I'll play it in a lot of my black decks, but I actually have, I did cut it from a couple of my black decks, so. Okay. I only drafted it once and played it in that deck, and it was, it was, it was actually pretty good. I was, I was moderately impressed. Um, but I also thought the card was bad, so that it's... Like one of those, you know, got a. It didn't match my expectations. Well, uh, this is boring because we opened a pack guardian. Uh, oh, well, and we have Arlen Cord, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, perfect. So, pack guardian <laughs> is green, green, too. For 4 3 wolf spirit, it has flash, and when it enters the battlefield, you may discard a land card if you do put a 2 2 into play. We said on the, during the set review, the uncommon one, that we thought this could be the best uncommon. Uh, so far, it has been the best uncommon for me. Yep, it is. I mean, it's. Definitely out of this pack, the most powerful card by a wide margin. And yeah, um, I think we were talking a little bit about uh, possible other uncommons that were competing with it. But I'm I'm pretty much going to continue to say that this is going to be the best uncommon. Yeah, it was... It was... 
it's like so good. Like it's it's so good. Mm-hmm. I it was basically always great. I never had it not be great. Yeah, so. it was funny. Um, we we were doing some practice seals, mm-hmm. and we had a deck with two of them, and I was playing versus it, and Aaron had played the first one. So then he had two cards in his hand, and he knew one of them was a forest from a search effect. And I'm, like, thinking to myself, I'm, like, well, I'm, like, I'm like, what can you have? And I, like, attack. And he, like, plays Pack Guardians. And I'm, like, oh, <laughs> I forgot there's two in the deck. <laughs> oh, man, blowouts. Sick blowouts, Aaron Maranaka. Yep. All right. Well, next up we have... Uh, so we now have a sweet deck already. <laughs> next, sorry. <laughs> next, not really, but, uh, next we have, uh, Singwary Mage again. Uh, so for pack three, this is. We have Soulbind Snapper. We're not taking either of those cards. Soulbind Snapper is the 6-6 six, six for six turtle that can't attack unless you cast a non-creature spell. Strength in Arms. This card made a lot of 1-1s one for me so far. Uh, um. you... Have you had that experience? It's the it, instant it, that puts the, plus, plus two, plus two, and if you can control an equipment, it puts a one-one into play? Um, I did play one in my basically white weenie deck for one of my draft decks. Uh, I never cast it, but I had – I'm trying to think how many equipment I had. I had the Scarecrow. I had the Transform equipment. I think that was it. But I think I was just playing it as like a plus two, plus two that maybe sometimes I'll get a one-one out of it. Next up, we have Angelic Purge. It's one white and two for a sorcery. As an additional cost to casting it, sacrifice a permanent. This card's been okay. Yeah, I I actually like this card a, a lot. I think this card. I think the first card, uh, the first Angelic Purge, is really strong. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's pretty easy to have a leftover land laying around when you cast this because usually you're not casting this on turn three. You're casting it on turn five or six, and so it's not that it's not that big of a deal to give up a land to uh to remove a creature so i think or i think it gets planeswalkers too right because i know aaron said yeah that. so it's it's uh exile target uh it's as additional cost sacrifice oh, no. an exile target artifact creature, creature or enchantment. enchantment not planeswalker but still i i yeah i definitely think the first one of these is really strong so in a white deck um i want to take the first one of these really high then obviously they kind of fall off a little bit i think the second one's still really good because usually you're not going to draw them in multiples I already know we're going to disagree on this pick. Also, this pack apparently had a foil in it, because there's three uncommons still. Hmm. Or I guess it doesn't have to have had a foil. No, they could have taken a common, so, like Fiery Temper. Um, so we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine commons. How many commons are in a pack? Um, let's see. So you have three uncommons and a rare. So you have ten commons. So a rare, a common. Oh, yeah, you're right. So there should be... Because this is the third pack, right? Right. So the, the one of the uncommons is just foil, right? Uh, So there's 14 cards. So ten, ten commons in a pack. Three so uncommons. But the common is missing because of the foil anyway. So that means... Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Anyway... <laughs> Cathar's Companion is next. It's two and a white for a 3-1. Uh, whenever you cast a non-creature spell, it gains it indestructible. I did find this card to be better than I thought it was, but I thought it would be bad. Um, it's it's okay. I think it's kind of filler, and it specifically wants to be in, like, either a deck with lots of equipment or, or and then, like, lots of strength and arms and, like, stuff like that. Yeah. I just... did see somebody cast a multiple... Um, uh, what is the... So I saw somebody make this card indestructible like every turn in a row uh, by casting bad cards. I can't remember the name of the card that they were cast. But I was like, oh, okay, well, I guess that makes that good. <laughs> yeah, th- th- this to me is just a mediocre curve filler. Yeah. There's, there's better three drops to be available. but if A lot better. Yeah, if you're in desperate need of like creatures, then this will do the job. We already talked about mag- Magmatic Chasm. Drew, I know we're going to disagree on this pick because I'm taking the next card. It's, well, what's the card? It's aim high. It's one green and one for an instant. <laughs> that target creature gets plus two plus two and gains reach until end of turn. Yeah, I I don't want to take this third. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm taking this. <laughs> yeah, I definitely. I, I I I would rather take angelic purge, even though we have two green cards already. I'm taking I'm taking aim, aim high. <laughs> the uh, the last two commons are thornhide wolves. That's a four and a green for a four five. Not taking that. I'd rather uh, take wolves that aim high. Oh my gosh! Stop! <laughs> Stop! Stop it! 
Dauntless Cathar is next. It's one two and one white. It's a three two. It's a human soldier. You can you can pay two mana, one white and then one, to exile it from your graveyard to put a one one spirit into play. Only activate this ability anytime you can cast a sorcery. Uh, this is a much better three drop than Cathar's Companion. Yeah, it is. This card's uh, real good. Yeah, I, getting two white cards, like two powerful white commons here. Um, I'm pretty inclined to take a white card here. Taking Aim High still. <laughs> I actually think Aim High is really good. I mean, it's fine. It's it, it's a combat trick, but I it, it's certainly not a card I want multiples of. And usually, I find I can pick these cards up like that uh, later in the draft. So, okay, Evacenian Missionaries is next, or Evacenian Missionaries. It's three and a white for a three three. Being of your upkeep, if it's equipped, transform it, and it transforms into a four four and kills a guy. Yeah, um, so I think this card is maybe a little bit worse than I had initially thought it would be. Um, I know Travis drafted a double Avicennian Missionaries deck and tried to take every single equipment he could, So and ended up only going 1-2 at the draft, and he said it was really mediocre. Um, I think that it's, like, I think that the good equipment is the one the one that we know about, the the... Two mana one that equips for two that gives a human an additional plus one plus so and gives plus one plus one in vigilance. Yeah, that one's good. The transform one's decent. Interestingly enough, it's worse in a human deck. Yeah, obviously the human. And then deck. shard of broken glass was pretty good in our testing. Hmm, interesting. We still have not played with the card because we just keep putting it in our sideboard. So yeah, it was pretty good in black white hmm. delirium style stuff. Uh, Groundskeeper's next, we're not taking that. And then Haunted Cloak is bad, and we're not taking that. So, I think the pick here is between Angelic Purge and Aim High. <laughs> um, I think you could also make an argument for Dauntless. I think you could, too. I think you could, too. If, if, if I was being... I, I'm, t- I would take the Aim High. Um, I, I know I'm... I, the thing is, is, like, deep down in my heart, I know I'm losing equity by doing it. But... I don't yeah. know. I'm pretty happy taking a white card here. We got two great white commons, a, an okay white uncommon. You know, we kind of have talked about that. It, the power level is maybe not quite there, but it's still a white uncommon that maybe sometimes will win you a game. So I think getting three white cards at this point in pack in pick three makes me really – I really want to take a white card here and jump into white. Um, so I, I'm i looking probably at Angelic Purge because, like I said, I think the first mm-hmm. purge is really good. Um, and even though Dauntless Cathar is, like, the premier common creature for white, you can still kind of fill out your curve with other creatures besides sure. Dauntless Cathar. So I'm I, 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 I'm going to take Angelic Purge here. Okay. Uh, my heart says take Aim High. My head says take Angelic Purge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I definitely think you can get cards like Aim High later in the draft, even if you end up being, being green-white, so... Uh, next up, we have our next segment, which is Biggest Movers. So we talk about the cards that moved the most for us in our quote-unquote pick orders. So I don't really have a pick order, but like these are the cards that moved the most in my head. And for me, I I think that we had like the lengthiest discussion on the entire cast about this card specifically, Drew. And that's a Cursed Witch. Or a Cursed uh, Witch? Yeah, we, we had a pretty pretty decent discussion on it. Uh, it's three and a black for a four-two. It's a creature human shaman. Uh, spells that you cast to target your opponent. Uh, spells your opponents cast to target a curse, which costs one less to cast. When it dies, return it to the battlefield attached, un, uh, attached to a op- target opponent. And it, and when it's attached to them, spells you control costs one less to target them, and they lose one life. You gain one life. Um, this card slam first pickable. Um, I think this card is insane. I had, I have two of them in one deck, one of them in my sealed deck, one of them in another deck, um, and it was often the best card in play. Yeah, this card I think is great when things are even or when you're ahead. I don't think it's very good when you're behind um, because if they remove it or it even on, if they it depends trade. on the deck that you're behind from, right? If the deck sure. is just attacking with a bunch of four power guys, like then it's still great. Yeah, I uh, or four toughness guys, I should say. Yeah, it's 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 definitely a very good card. Um, I've I've had two opponents play it versus me, and both times it just literally didn't matter. I was just like, hmm, interesting. Wh- whatever, you have a four or two, I don't care. Like, sure, it's gonna die. You're gonna get uh, an enchantment. Don't care. So I, I I definitely think it's great. Like I'm I'm not I'm not discounting the card, but I am saying that um, 
sometimes the enchantment isn't what you want, right? Like, sometimes you're like, okay, I got a 4-2 for 4, not the greatest card, right? Like, okay. it's a giant cockroach, and then you're like, I the enchantment is not going to help me this game, so. Interesting. I I had a vastly different experience. I, in, I, I thought this card was, like... Uh, I ended up actually first picking this card in the one in the draft that I got two of them. I was like, well, this card's like been insane in my last two events. I'm gonna take it. Yeah, I mean, I could definitely see in multiples it being very good. Right? <laughs> like having. Oh two- yeah, when I had two, I actually did get a game where I had two of them in play, and it's like, well, good luck beating this siege. Like. Yeah, and and like I said, if you're if if you're if you're even and you're trading when you're even, I think it is very good. And the other thing is, so many board stalls I found happening that like it just made it better. Yeah, sure. I like I said, I I think it's a great card. I think it's a great black uncommon. Obviously, it's it's very high pick, possibly first pickable. I'm just saying there are certainly circumstances where it just yes. is not going to be a good card. Yeah, if you're and, behind, it, if you're behind for, by by multiple four four toughness creatures. You're probably it's probably not that great of a top deck because yeah. like the one life isn't going to give you a lo- the one the two life swing a turn is going to be going to give you enough time still. Yeah, and generally if you're getting beaten down, like your opponent doesn't care if they're losing one. All they care about is you gaining one, and really gaining one life a turn is like kind of mediocre anyway. So uh, I, I'm I, like I said, and I understand that's the way magic cards work. A lot of the times, you know, sometimes cards just situationally aren't going to be good. But my experience both times I had it played against me just didn't care that the guy had the card. So interesting. Did he do well in the draft outside of that? Um, yeah, I believe, well, let's see. Yeah, I think, I de- the one was at the pre-release, and I think he went 3-2. And the other one was in a team draft, and our team swept, so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Good talk. Um, what was your biggest mover? Uh, my biggest mover, I think, was Macabre Waltz. Um, I was really impressed with Macabre Waltz and the Madness deck I had. Um, I, I honestly just kind of incidentally threw it in. I'm like, oh, I guess it's a Madness outlet. I'm like, eh, maybe I can get some decent value off of it. And every single time I'm like, holy cow, this is insane. I'm like, bring like an incorrigible use back and another creature, discard my incorrigible use, smash you. Like, oh, it was, it was really good. I was really, really impressed with Macabre Waltz. Also to a lesser extent, Tormenting Voice. Also kind of a similar effect, right? Like discarding a card. But the thing about Macabre Waltz is like, Tormenting Voice, if you top deck it when you don't have like any Madness cards in your hand, you're kind of like, eh. Macabre Waltz, I played at the pre-release and I had a similar experience with it. It was turning, first of all, it was turning on Delirium really easily. As well as, like, oh, man, it was so good. I got, there was one time I got back the Scarecrow, <laughs> and then got, like, to, to, and, which turned off my Delirium, and then I got to sack the Scarecrow. It was just, like, so easy to, like, manipulate Macabalt's in this set. Yeah, there's a ton of value you can generate with Macabalt's. So, um, and usually in the past, Macabalt's was always just kind of like a filler card. Mediocre. Right? Yeah. yeah. Not great, but it's not terrible. I think in this set, it's very, very, very good. It's very easy to get a ton of value off of your Macabre Waltz. Um, so I, th- this card seriously impressed me. There was actually several cards that impressed me, but I'm picking Macabre Waltz because I felt like it had the, um, it had the, the, it moved the most for me. Because the other cards, I feel like, yeah, I would play these cards, and they ended up being a little bit better than they thought. Macabre Waltz was a card I wasn't really thinking about that I would play. Ended up playing it and was really, really uh, happy with it. Let's move on to the. Let's move on. Like I think that we uh, we are learning a lot, and this set is so fun. I love this set. Yeah. Uh, training grounds this week is obviously Channel of Innistrad's common set review. So we're gonna start with red, and I'm gonna go first. So my three. We're just we're gonna do it a little differently this time. Uh, we're just gonna read the list, and then we're gonna talk about each card on the list. So my three is tormenting voice. It moved up quite a bit for me. Uh, well, there in. Uh, Duelist is next, and then uh, Fiery Temper were my three. And then, Drew, your three were uh, number three, Reduced to Ashes, Voldarian Duelist, Fiery Temper. So the only difference here is I had Tormenting Voice and you had Reduced to Ashes. Yeah, and the reason I went Reduced to Ashes is because you'll probably play it in almost any red deck. Um, Tormenting Voice, great in a black-red Madness deck. I Much, much, much better um, on your pick order in that kind of a deck. Probably a little bit worse than, like, in a Werewolf deck. Um, reduce to Ashes, you'll always play. So I guess Reduce to Ashes is just kind of a safe pick, right? Like, right. You, you'll safely play this card or whatever. It's not exciting. It's five mana. It's a sorcery. You know, it's... Card, card that I was impressed with after making this list 
um, at common was the three three wolf for three that can't block unless you have another wolf. Um, yeah, I think it's um, I think it's okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's it's definitely great in like a beatdown deck. Um, if at any point you're trying to block with it, though, it can get pretty bad. Right, uh, and it, it it can go really bad too. Like I I know we had one game where um, there was that guy in play, and there was one other wolf. And it was like, okay, don't kill the wolf, and then like the wolf died, and you're like, oh great, like it's removing two blockers, right? Like if you right. need to block That's that true. creature, and they can remove a wolf, then you're all of a sudden like stuck with yeah. no blockers. So, I, I I think it's I think it's a pretty decent card. You know, a three three for three at common is great, and it's easy to cast, which is nice. But I mean, there there is definitely a drawback to the card. So yeah, we both had Voldaren Duelist on the list, though. That's three and a red for a three two haste, and when it enters the battlefield, target creature can't block. Holy crap, did this card get people? Yeah, this card is insane. This is, like, a very, very strong red card. I mean, just comes down, clears the best blocker out of the way, and all of a sudden you're getting smashed in for, like, 8 to 11 points of damage pretty easily. Yeah, we both had Tormenting Voice at number... Or, not Tormenting Voice, uh, Fiery Temper at number 1. I don't know that there's, like, an explanation here. It's... It does... It does Lightning Bolt impressions. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, it's... It's insane in a madness deck. It's even good in ever ever yeah, else too. Yeah, it's reasonable in an odd madness deck, like three mana for three damage. Not exciting, but you know what? It's been a red staple in limited sets for years and years and years. So you know what? We'll play it. But yeah, definitely when it's doing the madness thing, pretty pretty bonkers. Next up, we on the list we have green commons. So my green commons at number three, I have solitary hunter. At number two, I have Aim High. <laughs> and at number one, I have Rabbit Bite. I don't have Aim High anywhere on my list. <laughs> you um, have Byway Carrier, Solitary Hunter, and Rabbit Bite. Yeah. Um, obviously, Rabbit Bite, just, you know, a fight card that doesn't even fight, so... It's so um, good. Yeah. Um, it was so good for me. It made Black Green... I like. We'll get into this, like, another week, but I think that Black Green is the best archetype by a significant margin. Hmm. Like, a, a very, very huge margin. And I think that cards like this and some of the removal in Black have a huge amount to do with it, and, like, the common and uncommon level in, the, in that, in those colors specifically, um, and how you can you can really build a great deck. And I think that Rabid Bite, which we both have at number one, has, you know, it, it's just, like, uh, we were. I think that we probably, if you've drafted green, you've probably gotten them a little bit later than you should be getting them, because I don't think that people realize how good they are. And I think the same thing could be true. We both have Solidarity Hunter on our list, and I think the same could be true about that card. I don't people think people realize how good a 3-4 for 4 is, just on its surface. Like, I think that there are a few things in the set that people who aren't used to drafting a ton don't realize. Yeah, um, I I definitely think a three four for four on Solidary Hunter is very very good for its stats. Um, usually, I think I actually like three fours a little bit better than four threes. Yeah, uh, me too. Because three fours block quite a bit better than four threes um, and still attack pretty well. Yeah, exactly. And then you know when you flip it, it's a five six, which is huge. So yeah, I think Solidary Hunter is great. Yeah, I mean Rabbit Bite is clearly just straight up green removal, it's green Doom Blade, right? So. That is high praise. That is high praise. Uh, so next up, obviously, we have Rabid Bite on this list. Or not Rabid Bite. We have Aim High on this list. So why don't you talk about how great Aim High is? <laughs> um, Aim High is a perfectly mediocre combat trick. You'll play it in your green deck, you know. <laughs> so first of all, one thing that I found in this set is that green specifically, in your green decks, you have you – have you have things like Rabbit Bite that you have, and then you have Sorcery Speed Removal Spells in, in your black decks, like uh, the one that destroys a trap creature, and then you'll have the Dead Weights, and you'll have the Sinister Concoctions. But what, what you don't have in those decks is Instants. So I found that I was playing you know, Aim High a little bit more often, uh, and that's great for me because I think the card is good. Um I I love the untapped things. I love cards that let me outplay my opponent, um, and this card does it really well. Uh, I guess the other nice thing too is it's all, uh, having instances good in your werewolf there, deck. Yes, that's true too. So, yeah. So I I think the card gains equity because 
the, it's, it might be the best green common instant, and that's important. I I just went ahead and went with a good solid two for one creature. Um, it's uh, it's pretty. That card that card impressed me too. I was I was thoroughly impressed actually. Yeah. I was I found myself like being happy to attack, happy to block. Like that's not always the the like the feeling you get with a three drop. Yeah, I I I I mean ha- having a three power three drop that will draw you a card later in the game I think is awesome. So I I I think byway courier is pretty great. Um, next up on our list, we have blue cards. Drew, what do you have for blue? Um, so my blue, so for number three, I have Stormrider Spirit. That's four and a blue for the 3-3 Flash Flying Spirit creature. Uh, for number two, I have Sleep Paralysis, the three and a blue enchantment. When it comes into play, it taps Enchanted Creature, and then the Enchanted Creature doesn't untap on the, uh, it's on, you on tap step, or controllers on step however that's worded and then my number one pick was just the win the one in a blue for return target creature to its owner's hand with madness cost of one blue my three were nimbleus of dusk uh just the wind and sleep paralysis so uh have you played with storm uh rider spirit in the set yet I haven't played with it, but I have played against it. Um, and the reason I like it, um, I like having it higher, I think, than the three mana flyer is there are, there's enough instant speed things going on with blue. Like there's the, uh, there's the remove soul card, but is it deny existence? The two and a blue counter target creature spell. Yeah. Um, and I actually played versus a deck that had two storm riding spirits and two deny existence. It's, it's pretty hard to play against that deck when they have five open mana, right? Because mm-hmm. you're like, well, I can attack, but I'll like, you know, get crushed by storm rider spirit. I can play a creature and not attack, but then like, they'll just counter it. So I, I, I think storm rider spirit's pretty good. I mean, a three, three for five flyer is, you know, reasonable anyways, um, the fact that you get to have, you know, pass with having mana up as a blue blue mage is uh, I think, pretty great. I think that I might have had the card rated too highly because not only did the card not eat, meet my expectations, I found it to be one of the worst cards in my deck. I was very, very unhappy with with uh, Storm Rider Spirit. Just too slow. Just doesn't match up. Yeah, it, like it was a white blue deck, which uh, I think is one of the worst color combinations in this set, also. <laughs> But I was not impressed. Like, I I felt like I was forced to do things that I didn't want to do because of that having that card in my deck. And it could be that I just, it might be better in something like green-blue or, you know, red-blue or something. And it just wasn't very good in blue-white. But it was a spirit. So it's like, and I was playing the spirits deck. And uh, I don't know, I wasn't impressed. But that being said, it's probably good in another deck. And it, I did have it, like, pretty highly when I was looking at this head initially. Um Nimbus of Dust, though, that card outperformed for me. Holy crap. Yeah, so it's interesting because I think Nimbus of Dust is great in the type of deck you're talking about, like a blue-white beatdown deck. Um, I think it's maybe a little bit worse than, say, like a blue-black control deck. Right. Um, You know, you'll still play it, obviously, because, you know, you want win conditions in your blue-black control decks, but um, it doesn't block super well, and a lot of times you want your creatures to be able to block pretty well. um, Right. That's true. That's true. Uh, And... Um, yeah, and and that could be why I know somebody else who was playing Blue Black Control had a different said they were having a different experience with Storm Rider Spirit. So uh, we will have Sleep Paralysis. Um, this card is this card's good. Like th- this is what Blue gets, and Blue will take it. <laughs> yep, it's just four mana. You know, remove your biggest Kai from ever being able typically. To do it typically, when I find that I have something like Sleep Paralysis and Rabbit Bite in the same set, it really makes me want to draft Blue Green. Like, it means that I have enough stuff. So I'm interested to see if that archetype happens. And then we also both have Just the Wind. And we already talked about that card and why we both think it's good. Yeah, Just the Wind is great. Um, I mean, one in a blue for returning a creature card is uh, a blue card you would play in most decks most of the time. Um, the fact that you can get a great uh, great synergy, obviously, with Madness is pretty powerful. Um, it's much better when you're getting, you know, some sort of value off of your unsummon as well. So, yeah, Just the Wind is a pretty great blue card. You're pretty happy to take these high. Uh, I believe Aaron had six in a deck he drafted, and he went undefeated, so... We have the same three cards for white, though. We have Puncturing Light, Dauntless Cathar, and Angelic Purge, and we just switched. I have uh, Dauntless Cathar higher than you do, and you have Angelic Purge, and we both have Puncturing Light at one. Yeah, um... 
Puck Tree Light is just... Um, um, I actually have it as the best common in the set. That's interesting. I... Pretty sure fire. I like fiery temper more than puncturing light. Oh, I like dead weight, murderous, Compos- murderous compulsion, and puncturing light all more than fiery temper. Really? Hmm. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Um. Why do you like puncturing light more than fiery temper? Uh, it kills the same things, and it does it for less mana. It actually kills bigger things too. <clears throat> I just think the potential for, like, there's so much upside to fiery temper. That's right? true. I mean, you have so much potential to just get, like, a really powerful effect with Fiery Temper. Puncturing Light just always does the same thing. Yeah, I also found red and blue to be the worst colors, and that might have put made me want Puncturing Light more. Hmm. I can definitely see that. Um, yeah, I put Angelic Purge over Dauntless Cathar, because, like I said, I think the first Angelic Purge is very good. Right. It might, it might even be that the first Angelic Purge is better than your first Puncturing Light. That That could be true because of, like... But but you would play three Angelic Purge in a heartbeat and wouldn't do that with Angelic Purge. Uh, three Puncturing Lights, yeah. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah, I'm, uh, yeah I'm, I'm pretty sure I would play three Puncturing Lights um, pretty easily. But yeah, three, three Angelic Purge, probably a bit too much. So yeah, so Angelic Purge is a card I think you you are extremely happy to have one of. You're probably pretty happy to have two of, and then they start to go down a little bit in value. For which one? For Angelic Purge. Oh, I thought you were talking about Puncturing Light. I was like, what? No, no, no they don't? They no. never go down. <laughs> they do the same thing. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I, I like those a lot. I, I I I still think Fiery Temper is much, much better than... Yeah, uh, and I I mean, I could be wrong. That's just what I... This was from my weekend, like, my analysis. Uh, so it's a small sample size. So we'll, obviously, it could become my biggest mover. It could go down. Uh, but I, I agree. I think Angelic Purge is great. And I think that we kind of talked about this a little bit during the pick two, but I think that the Cathar is like the premium white common creature. Oh yeah, easily. Um, I yeah, it's pretty hard to think of a better common creature than Cathar. It's just it's it, it's it's kind of similar to Byway Courier, right? Like they're both three twos for three. But this they, one's better. <laughs> they both give you a, yeah. I mean, uh, Byway Courier, you know, you're paying two mana to draw a card. And this one, you're paying two mana to get a one-one flyer, um, so you're you're able to maintain tempo uh, right. while you're uh, while you're getting your value off of it. Also, Dauntless Cathar is also great if you incidentally mill it. So next up, we have Black. Oh, that's true too. That's that's why I had that. Yes, don't forget that, guys. You can, <laughs> you can mill it. Next up, come up. <laughs> next up, we have Black, uh, and this my number three was really hard. Um, I think we almost had the same three cards, but, like, I just played the set, and I have Crow of Tidings at number three, and it, it it was so good. Like, oh my gosh. Uh, do you know that thing does it when it dies? Yep. So, for those who haven't read Crow of Tidings yet, uh, it's two and a black for a two-one. Uh, it has flying, and I believe it's a zombie bird. It is a zombie, yep. Uh, which also important in the set. Uh, when it enters the battlefield or dies, put the two top two cards of your gri- library into your graveyard. So I thought this card was pretty decent when I was reading the set. I'm like, oh, this is a card like you'll always play. After playing the set, uh, I found this card good in blue black in, in every black deck. I wanted this card, and uh, it's I, I, Drew and I are on a similar plane where we would typically take removal. Over any creature, early in a draft. Good removal, yeah. And, or e- and, even reasonable removal. Yeah, reasonable removal. Um, so you at number three, you have throttle. Yeah, and I can definitely see maybe crow being better than throttle. Again, I think throttle similar to my red pick of reduced ashes. Sure. It's just kind of the safe. It's a five mana removal spell. It's boring. You'll play it. That kind of a thing. Um. But I could definitely see there being black creatures that are better than um, than Throttle. Uh, for example, I'm 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 still not really sure how good like uh, Stallion is the 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 horse. three three Delirium one. Yeah, I'm I'm that card's been really good for me. Yeah, I'm still not entirely sure how good it is. Um, so it may possibly be that that's like a better card, better creature. Uh, Crow was pretty good for me, too, but I also had, uh, when I was playing Crow in my pre-release deck, I had Relentless Dead, 
Um, and he actually got back Crow a couple times, which is pretty sweet. <laughs> that is uh, pretty sweet. So, yeah, so I mean, I, I definitely, and like you said, being a zombie, I think is, there's a lot of synergies going on with zombies. So I definitely like Crow a lot. Um, I just, I kind of was like, well, I'm, I'm still not really sure shit how everything's shaking out. Um, so I'm just going to make the safe pick and go with Crow. Sure. So the next two picks, we will have the same two cards, but in different orders. And this was actually a debate at the draft table for us. And that is Murder's Compulsion or Deadweight. And, I was originally on the side of Murder's Compulsion. Yeah, it's really interesting to me. It's funny because, like, I hated Sheer Drop <laughs> in Battle for Zendikar, but I actually really like Murder's Compulsion a lot here. And I even had Murder's Compulsion be actively bad for me. I, had someone I did, it. too. And that's actually why I moved it down. I had someone playing Always Watching on me, and I was just like, uh... <laughs> Uh, I, I also had that exact same experience. <laughs> I can't kill any of your creatures, but I think the fact that you can trigger this at instant speed with Madness cards makes it insanely have some very powerful uh, potential for some really powerful plays. Um, I that's the thing is like I actually rated a lot of the Madness cards really high. Uh, I guess mostly one, the first draft deck I had was a really powerful red-black Madness deck. So, obviously, I had a really positive experience with Madness. But I also think that those these Madness cards... So, these are Madness cards that you would be happy first picking in a normal set, right? Like, maybe not happy, but you would be like, I, I can first pick a Murderous Compulsion. You could first and, pick a Murderous Compulsion and a Fiery Temper. I don't think that that is... Yeah, Um but the fact that you have the potential to get a ton of value off of it by madnessing it, I think makes them much, much, much better. Um, so I, I I ended up rating all the madness cards as number one, if they were available, obviously, as a madness card in the, the color. Um, and so that's why I have them so high, is because to me, they are cards that I would play no matter what. But if I madness them, they're very powerful. Okay. And Deadweight is a card that the reason that I had it at number one is, man, this card is efficient. <laughs> mm-hmm. Man, I like, I remember how good Deadweight was at Innistrad, and it's still that good. Like, it's also great because it's an enchantment, right? So. Yeah, it's like better. It's like so good. <laughs> um, and you can like, it's like one of those things where you like put it on their two four, and it's like, well, that two four is like actually dead anyway. Like, good yep. job. Yep, I actually had that come up in a couple games where someone played a 2-4 versus me, and I was just like, all right, dead weight, it. Sma- still smashing. And then, yeah, and they're like, well, I guess I'm blocking. Like, Yeah. No, definitely, I, I agree. I think dead weight is very, very, very powerful. Um, it's, it is it is much better than a shock because of that reason, because you can right. play it on a larger creature and, and basically make the creature... Yeah, even on a 3-4, that thing's a 1-2 now, guys. Yeah. Yeah, so I agree. I think Deadweight is great. I think Murder's Compulsion is great. Um, I, 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 like I said, I think the potential for Madness is so powerful. I don't think there's a wrong answer here. I know that we're ranking the cards, but like, let's be real. You're gonna take either one you see. Yeah. Um, I, like I said, I would take, I would, first pick, first pack, if both are in the pack, I would take Murder's Compulsion. I, I think that I, I think that I did this exact thing. I did a, uh, unboxing today for the YouTube channel where I, I p- said what I'd pick out of each pack. So it was like a 40 minute unboxing. <laughs> and it was really fun, but I think I had this exact thing and I think I did pick Murder's Convulsion in the end. Yeah, I just think because if it's first pick, first pack, I mean, if you end up in a red black madness deck, oh, you're going to be way happier with Murder's What was Convulsion. interesting from that entire box that every single Fiery Temper pack had a better uncommon or rare in it. Oh. Yeah, so like there was like it was like the second to last pack, and I opened a fiery temper. I'm like, man, we still haven't picked a fiery temper first. And then I was like, oh, this pack's really bad. And I get to the last card, and it's Avison's Judgment. And I'm like, well, <laughs> I... <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. It's funny. the The first draft I did, I actually I think I only got one fiery temper, but I got two lightning axes, so I couldn't really complain. Yeah, and then I had another pick that was lightning axe over fiery temper, and it's like, well, it, like this isn't fun. <laughs> it's fun for me because I'm getting better cards than Fiery Tempers, but, like, I don't know. It's a very interesting set. What do you think of the commons overall? After drafting the set, for me, it was – the commons are super good. Like, this is a very popper set and yeah. not, not a – or a peasant set, what do they call it? 
Um, I mean, you're talking about a set where like the commons are good. Yeah, the commons are really good. No, I agree. And 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 the great thing is, I actually think I think cards that people are thinking are chaff are actually better than what people are initially giving them credit for. Like a couple cards that um, I think were sinister concoction potential. Well, sinister concoction is great by itself. Um, right, but what I'm saying is like people don't realize it yet that that card's like insane. I'm talking about cards like um, what is it, Molder Graph with the O4 for two. Um, oh yeah, I played a deck with three of those, and like, I'm and that card was great. Uh, let me see if I can find the name. Mold, Moldgrass Scavenger. Every every single time I've had we were building sealed decks with green cards in them, I kept looking at the guy and I'm like, I really want to play this guy. Like, I the thing is like, here was my experience at the pre-release. So at the pre-release, I had a blue black flyer slash zombie deck, right? Uh, so. Um, I I only had one rare. It was the Relentless Dead, which is a decent rare. But I played five else. rares. <laughs> I'm so well, lucky. Yeah, Aaron also had like six rares in his deck, and he smashed me because he's like, "Oh, let me play my uh, the two two that flips and makes one ones." Always watching. Uh, I can't remember. He just kept like avalanching rares on top of me, and I'm like, "I'm trying to race you with flyers, and it's just not happening." Um, but anyways, so my experience was I had one Delirium card in my um, in my blue black deck. I, I only really had one card to an, quote unquote enable delirium. That was Core of Dark Tidings. But I found even when I wasn't drawing Core of Dark Tidings, I was incidentally just getting delirium anyways. Even when I didn't have a delirium card in play, even when I didn't play Core of Dark Tidings, I would just incidentally have delirium at some point in the game. So I'm thinking a card like Moldgraph Scavenger may be quite a bit better than what people are thinking because, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, it, you are discovering the reason that I found Green Black to be the best deck, Drew. Yeah, I mean, if Scavenger is consistently a 3-4 on turn 4, it's really good, right? Like, it's an 0-4 yeah. for 2, so it can block in the early game, and then all of a sudden it turns into a 3-4, and you got, you know, this kind of... It's almost like a suspend card in that sense a little bit that can actually block. Um, so that was a card that I thought was really good. I thought Ghostly Wings was quite good, too. I also thought that card was good. Yeah, um, I mean, there was a ton of flexibility. There was a... a there was one game where I played it on their four drop and then just pass and then uh, was able to bounce both their four drop and another card by using uh, Into the Wind. So kind of like a, you know, bounce two creatures. I had to use two cards to do it, but it was still such a huge tempo swing. It let me win the game. Um, also, you can play it on your own creature. Mm -hmm. Obviously done that, you know, play it on a creature, fly over, that kind of a thing. And it gives your creature a little bit of protection. Um, so that, that card was impressing me. Um, I played, what is it? Pur is it Purge Evil? Purge the Evil? The white card? The tap card? Um, I don't know what card you're talking about. Let's see. Uh, uh, what is the name of the card? It's the one that taps two creatures and it investigates. Um, I'm scrolling through right now. Expose Evil. That's the name of the card. Oh, okay. Uh, so it's one in white, it's an instant tap up to two target creatures and you investigate. Um, had this in my, it, it was basically a white weenie deck. Um, so, but this, this card was pretty good too. It let me win a race, you know, a really, really, like we were, it was a really tight race. Like I had an always watching out, but then he had an Ordric and he was able to keep giving his creatures flying with the Ordric. Um, but I was able to use the exposed evil like at you know on a crucial turn to allow me to turn the tides. Um, so like that card I thought was better than I had initially anticipated. Um, I think even cards like Militant Inquisitor, which is I I don't think it's a great card, but um, it's still a card that you would play probably in like your sealed decks. Um, another green card, Stoic Builder. I mean, there's so many commons that I, th that we were playing with that I was just like, I don't think this card's that great. And then you played it, and they're like, this is better than we thought. Or like, yeah. Terror Constable was an example of another card that we thought was not going to be very good and ended up being a card that we usually wanted one of in our white decks. So. Well, I mean, I think that in the in our set review, we didn't know any like how good Sinister Concoction was going to be, and we realized, I mean, I think we both realized it was great, right? Yeah, but I mean, Sinister Concoction, I think, is pretty easy, because I think even in a 
I think even in a non graveyard based slash discard based set, you would still play Sinister Concoction pretty. You easy. would, you would, like because you want things to kill things. Right. But in this set, it's like a bomb uncommon. Yeah, I mean it's 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 insane in this set. Like I had one guy, he like. <laughs> uh, he had a sinister concoction out or whatever, and I'm like, well, all right, attack you with my two evasive creatures. But then he's like, uh, you know, murderous compulsion, you know, activating my sinister concoction. I'm like, Ugh, that did not feel good at all. Yeah. <laughs> and then, like like you said earlier, like Macabre Waltz. Like, there's just things in the set that, oh, man. Dude, this set's so good. <laughs> yeah, this this set is awesome. Uh, Yeah, there's even more. Like, Stromkirk Mentor I thought was better than it looked. Uh, is that the 4-2? Yeah, that puts a counter on a vampire. Ugh. Come on, it's half of a, a, a Saddleback Legac. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> Don't you desecrate the name of Saddleback Legac in front of me, sir. I mean, but, I, like, in, it's the in a, same card as Saddleback Legac. Technically, you're just going to put the counter on the Saddleback Legac and only get the front end of the counter. Yeah, but I... Real here, Drew, it's the same card. I'm I'm just saying, I, I played with the card, and it was better than I thought. I I just played it because I'm like, well, I need a creature, and I played it, and I was like, oh, this is actually better. <laughs> oh, this <laughs> is like Saddleback Legac, man. Going from... From Bloodbred Elves to 4-2 Vampires. Yep. <laughs> with no upside. But, yeah. So, there, there's so many comments that I just kept thinking, like, yeah, there's so many great comments. And that's what was awesome about the first Innistrad, right? There was so many cards that, like, people were dismissing when the set first came out and ended up being cards that people would play in their limited decks. Um, like, tons and tons. Oh, of- did you get to play the Rice from the Tides deck? No, I have not played that yet. We had somebody play it. <laughs> How was it? They said it was the sweetest draft deck they ever played. <laughs> I think he two won. Yeah, so I definitely, I, I definitely think there's a there, there's there's a lot going on in the set, and I like that a lot. I like the fact that there's uh, that there's a lot of interesting things going on, um, and yeah, and you you really, I think you really get rewarded here for again drafting a good, powerful, synergistic deck. Yeah, I completely agree. Let's go on to where can people find you, Drew? Uh, I am on Twitter at MTG Drew, and I'm also on Facebook at Andrew Walden. Okay. And you can find me on Facebook at Spencer Stephen Helen and Twitter at Spencer 13 h You can find the show every week on ConstructorCriticism.com, YouTube.com, MTGOTraders.com, and PureMTGO.com. You can also follow the podcast at LTOMTG, I believe. I think that's what it is. I'm pretty sure. True, is that what it is? I'm I'm checking right now. <laughs> <laughs> Don't even know the Twitter account. Uh, I've tweeted there a couple times. Let's see. Uh, yeah, at LT oh, at yeah. LTO MTG. I got it right. I got it right. Yeah. Uh, don't forget to join the Constructive Criticism Facebook group where every week we will post the final segment of the show. How would you build it uh, with a sealed pool, and we discuss how how we would build it. Uh, Shoutouts. So this week, shout out to you, Drew. It was fun. This set's fun. I'm excited. I love magic. Oh my gosh. I got to talk about magic today, all day, with my video and you, and now people want me to go draft. Man, magic is great. Shout out to magic. Yep, yeah, magic is magic is absolutely awesome. Oh, um, I, I have an anti shout out though. So I have an anti shout out to people who ruin movies, and not in the way that you might think. So. Uh, over the past couple years, we have developed a world where it's cool to hate on things. And I'm here to tell you it's not cool. It's not cool to hate on Star Wars just because Star Wars is cool, so if you hate it, that means you're different and you're cool. It's not cool to hate on, like, perfectly reasonable films and then compare them to films that you're nostalgic about and say, well, it's not as good as this movie I liked when I was four. Well, guess what? You didn't really know how to evaluate a movie when you were four. If you go watch and go back and watch Power Rangers, it's not that great of a show, but I bet you haven't watched it since you were a little kid and you still think it was great. So I understand the love of things in the past. And the love of, you know, different things. And, but like, can we be real here? Batman vs. Superman was not great, but it was not the worst movie ever. And you're discrediting people who legitimately made the worst movies ever when they, you know, that might have been their goal. Like, not really. But I find it annoying that it's so cool to hate on things. For example, I am a huge defender of the prequels for Star Wars and Wizards of the Coast. 
The reason for this is Wizards of the Coast does a really good job creating the best game in the world. And while Moto sucks, Moto's gotten better every month since they launched the new co- the new client. The new client sucks. I hate it, but it's gotten better every month. So stop complaining and enjoy the things that are in front of you. Because, like, if you didn't get to enjoy The Force Awakens, that sucks for you because it was really cool. If you didn't get to enjoy, you know, if you don't get to enjoy Magic because you're busy complaining about it too much, stop. Look, look at what you're doing. You're playing this awesome game. And it's just not fun for the rest of us to listen to you complain about perfectly good things. So stop. And and Batman vs Superman was fine. It was fine. <laughs> it, was, uh, it was not the worst movie ever. It was fine. No. There were parts that were bad. <laughs> it was it, it was not the worst movie ever, but it was it, it, to me to me it was definitely a disappointment. So But that's uh, not the same thing as like it's like there are things that you can criticize about movies. For example, I don't like the Sherlock Holmes movies, the new ones. I find the cinematography hard to watch and it gives me a headache. But like, that doesn't make an awful movie. Like, you can not like things about a film. You cannot like Batman versus Superman because Batman kills a bunch of people. Right? Like, that's a thing that you could not like about the movie. But like you said, it wasn't the worst movie ever, right? No, right. I, I mean, I, I, I agree completely. Um, I do definitely think, um, I, I, I think I think there's some value to um, to uh, to a, to a solid criticism um, of things. Well, that's not the same thing. Like. Like calling the movie a worse, calling a movie like like just saying this movie sucked is not a criticism, right? Well, sure, yeah, absolutely. I and mean, that's, uh, and that's what this generation, or not even this generation, this that's what this has like the world has come to is just like like. It was so cool to hate on The Force Awakens for some people, and it's like, dude, that was a totally fine movie. I I also think part of this is um, the uh, kind of the squeaky wheel kind of uh, thing, right? Where people that are upset over and like vitriolic about how they feel about something, like for example, The Force Awakens or whatever, those are the people that are going to put their opinion. Um, on whatever forum they're putting their opinion on, whether that's Reddit or Facebook or whatever. Um, and people that don't, that maybe had a positive experience with the movie don't really, true. aren't going out of their way to put that out there. So it's kind of like, you hear, you hear a lot of the negative criticism because a lot of the negative criticism kind of rises to the top anyways. It comes up to the forefront. Um, so I, I definitely think that happens. Um, I, I, I do, I do think that there are, um, there, there is a benefit to being, to being, uh, to being critical of whatever it is that you are, um, whatever it is that you're watching or whatever it is that you're consuming. And by that, I mean, um, being analytical, being understanding that, um, you know, that there's always like, there's always going to be kind of like, uh, two multiple ways to, to view anything. There's multiple facets to view, um, to view like like a movie for example um you have to understand that there are things that are that people like a lot about a movie and there or any given movie and there's things that people don't like about a movie um for example i i like to think that i have a pretty broad range in terms of my taste of what i i like in a film um i can watch i can sit down and watch a uh, a silent film like Metropolis and try and, you know, appreciate what's going on with the film there. But I also can have fun, like in a fun kind of shoot 'em up action movie or whatever. Um, and also see what's good about that. But that also means that you can have, you can have good movies in any given genre. You can have like a good action movie, like John Wick, for example, I think is an example of a great action movie. It's shot very well. It has a very tight plot. Um, it has, uh, some fun, interesting characters. Um, like great great action flicks you can also have like bad action flicks action flicks that like you said you know you can have the way the film is shot that you end up feeling you know physically ill almost because of the way you know the shaky cam that's so popular now or that the fact that the action is just so confusing um that you don't know what's going on in the action which is actually uh which is a problem if if an action scene isn't shot well if it's not shot in a way that's able 
that's able to communicate to the audience what's going on in the given action scene, because even an action scene has a story to it. It has, um, it has a cadence. It has a tempo. It has characters that are interacting with each other that are at conflict. And if you can't communicate that to the audience, you lose your audience. But if you can communicate it well and communicate it effectively, you can have a more powerful film for that. And I, I, I do think you can see that there are benefits to having uh, criticism of films. Like, yeah, like, I'm not I'm not saying don't criticize films, though. That's not what I'm trying to say. Sure. I'm saying don't hate on it because you think it's cool to hate on it. Like, I I agree that there were parts of Batman for Superman, and it's a bad example because it wasn't a great film. But, like, I think that there were lots of people who enjoyed that film, and there were parts of it that if you weren't entrenched in that culture, in that Batman versus Super, in that Batman or Superman culture, that you might have liked. But, alas, there are parts that also bugged me, but I was critical of those moments, right? Being, you know, Metropolis and, and Gotham being 20 feet away from each other bugged me a lot. Like, it was a point that I couldn't get over. But I didn't go online and, like, give it a zero on Rotten Tomatoes when it didn't deserve it. Yeah, I mean, I I agree. Like, uh, like for example, I mean, I've, I've told you before some of the issues that I had with Force Awakens, but I always... I always like to have the caveat that I thought it was a fun movie and I liked it a lot. Like I, I thought it was a fun, enjoyable movie. Um, I just thought there was elements that maybe could have been uh, done a little bit better in the script. Um, sure. And I, and I think, I, I, I think that's always, always the case. Um, and I, I, I still personally strongly dislike the prequels. That's me. That's, that's my personal opinion. Yeah, I mean, uh, and I just like a new hope. So, <laughs> <laughs> Which is funny because uh, that uh, because definitely my two favorite films are still A New Hope and Empire. Like, oh uh, yeah, Empire's the best by a lot. Yeah, I, I don't know. Like, we could talk about Star Wars all day. Let's be real here. But what, what I what I really just want to get out is like, it, it like let's say that you have a problem with this podcast. Is this the worst podcast ever? No, it's not. Like, let's be real. <laughs> No. Even if you don't like this podcast, it is definitely not the worst podcast ever. But if you have a criticism for the podcast, let us know. We like hearing criticism. It makes the podcast better. Yeah. Um, and and I think that filmmakers or TV show, you know, directors or writers, your art people who do, you know, any kind of content in the world, they want criticism. That's what they want. They don't want just hating. Yeah. Um I mean yeah, absolutely. I mean, ultimately, if you if you strongly dislike a film, like just don't watch it. Like for example, like I, I, I do not like torture porn films. I just I don't see the appeal. Porn I don't, films? No, torture porn. Like Saw. Um, like P O R N. Yeah, have you not heard of that genre? They, they, it's literally called torture porn. It's basically, it's basically just like uh, gory horror movies where I don't watch any horror films. Okay, so there's there's definitely like kind of like an array of like different films you can have. But in when the I genre. see when I see things, for example, like The Purge, like commercials for that stuff, mm-hmm. it literally gives me nightmares. Okay. Yeah, the the purge isn't really torture porn. The purge is more like dystopian kind of like unsettling horror. I'm talking like you you have heard of Saw, right? Yes. Yeah. So Saw is kind of the one of the best examples of torture porn films. Um and there's there's actually a big run of those films in the mid 2000s when the genre was fairly popular. Um I hate those films. Um because I to me because I agree because they're unsettling to me and to me there's no reason for being unsettled like that. Now, that's not to say there's not horror movies that I love. Uh, one of my favorite films, probably one of my top 10, top 20 films, is The Thing, which actually is a little bit gory, but it's not it's not gory just for the sake of being gory. Um, mm-hmm. It's not like... Like, the problem I have with Torture Portland is it's just... It's it's kind of like disgusting, vile stuff just for the sake of that kind of stuff. And to me, like I the just... the Human Centipede? Yeah, like, that's a film I never want to watch. <laughs> I've never watched it. We were yeah. on a PTQ trip, and somebody told me about it. I'm like, why did you tell me this? Yeah, I, it, th- that, for example, is a film I never, ever want to watch. Like I said, I, I th- there's horror films that I can go and I can like, you know, like horror films. I definitely understand kind of the appeal of the conventional horror films. 
you know, like uh, Halloween or... Um, I, I don't know, dude. I had Nightmares After Sinister, so... <laughs> uh, Sinister was another uh, was a movie I actually saw in theater with a friend because she wanted to see it. So yeah, I mean, I could definitely see the appeal for certain horror films, but yeah, there, there's a whole there's a subgenre that I'm just like, nope, I'm not, I, I don't want to deal with that. I don't want to, I'm not going to touch it. But other people like it, so I mean, if they like it, I guess they pay money for it and they want to see it. So it exists. That's what it is. But yeah, to me, that that's a film. I'm just like, I just, I, I don't yeah, want, I don't, I don't want to watch it. Yeah, I had a I had somebody who was like Star Wars Force Awakens was bad, and they heard of all the things they they hated about it. And at the end of the conversation, I was like, "I'm well, I'm going tomorrow. Do you want to go see it again?" They're like, "Yeah." <laughs> and it's like, obviously, you didn't dislike it that much, bro. <laughs> like you liked it, you liked it. You didn't want to like it. You didn't meet your expectations, but like nothing's gonna meet those expectations. So just it's okay to have high expectations and and that, that that for me like when I get so and that's one of the things is like is that's why for me things like Avatar uh the blue people was like one of the, my least favorite movies ever is cuz it could never live up to the expectations that everybody put in front of it everybody walked out of the movie that was the best movie ever that was the best movie ever that was the best movie ever i walked out of it and i was like i just watched Ferngully. i don't even like that movie <laughs> yeah um no i i i can definitely understand that um i i i am much more um <clears throat> honestly the only movies i've found that kind of like meet expectations are really the like the true classics i guess you know for example like i recently watched the godfather a couple years ago um so and, i have not seen that movie it yeah is on my list of things to do this year <laughs> And and everyone, you know, obviously everyone's like, oh, it's one of the greatest movies of all time, blah, blah, blah. And I start watching it, and I'm like, is this really the greatest movie, one of the greatest movies of all time? For me personally, maybe not, because it doesn't fit my genre, and it doesn't necessarily fit my taste as much. But from a creative perspective, the way the film is shot, the script, the acting, the, you know, all, right, all that stuff. I think there's a real question to decide if you could be a movie critic or not. Drew, do you like Mean Girls? Uh yeah, it's a fun movie. <laughs> mm, I don't know if that was excited <laughs> enough. <laughs> what, Drew, do you have any shout outs this week? Um, so I I want to give a shout out to um, oh, Jace. Is he doing okay? Yeah, he's he's actually doing uh much better. Um, I I get I guess you heard. I don't I don't know. Do you know all the details with what happened or you just what you told me that he got in a car accident. Yeah, he got he got in a pretty bad car accident. Um his car flipped. Um ended up losing, well he he actually didn't lose anything, but the the top uh the top half of his like uh head, the skin got taken off. Oh. Wow. Uh, yeah, it was it, it was really bad. I saw some of the pictures and stuff. Um fortunately, he uh surprised he didn't even have a concussion, all things considered. Um but he uh, had to go to the hospital a couple times. Um, I've, I've talked to him a few times. He's doing, he's doing pretty well. He's just kind of like been on bed rest right now. Um, uh, but he's able to, he's able to talk. I actually, that's who I went and saw Batman and Superman with. Um, so all things considered, he's doing very well. And I'm very, very, very thankful, grateful that he is, he's doing well. Cause I would have been <laughs> really sad if he, uh, if if anything had happened, I, I'm hoping it sounds to me like the worst thing that's going to end up coming out of this is he's probably just going to have uh, a nice scar on the top of his head. So. All right. Well, shout out to Jace. I hope you get gets feeling better. Any other shout outs? Uh, shout out to Dave, Dave, uh, Dave Toe, uh, owner at the Lightning Game Grid. He's always super awesome, super nice. Um and yeah, I uh, I went to he, he he I was actually surprised at how many uh, how many people he got for each of his pre-release flights. But he always makes sure to keep the the players comfortable as you know as comfortable as he can in his store. So which I think is pretty awesome. You know, I know he capped I believe the Friday event at 50 players when there was other stores with quite a few more players than that because he just said, you know what, we are going to fit six people per table. We're not going to have people on corners or sitting on floors or anything like that, so we're just going to keep it nice and comfortable for everyone. Awesome. Go, Dave. All right, let's go over the last segment. How did we build – oh, for those who know, we're doing how you would – how would you build it at the end of the podcast? Um, for those like who are interested in the seal pool, I found this one to be interesting. I wasn't sure quite how to build it. Um, 
but I ended up on uh, Blue Black. Um, basically, I, I still needed a card to cut, and I was going to ask Drew what he would cut. But I, I think I would just cut the... Oh, man, it's so hard. I would probably cut the Pale Rider in the end, but I have... Uh, the black enchantment that makes them discard two, the four drop, the three three, the stallion we talked about, two of the skeletons, the two four that when it dies you investigate, the uh, uh, murderous compulsion, uh, the cobwalts, tooth collector, p- uh, pale steed, uh, the four drop four four that flips and then flips back and forth. You could flip it whenever you want. Uh, I-, I might actually just cut the. Actually, you know what? I think I'd cut the uh, voice, the vessel of the blue vessel, and then I have Stormrider Geist, uh, Sleep Paralysis, the one three zombie, Nimble uh, Nimbus of Dusk, uh, the five mana three five zombie, which I found to be very good so far, uh, and then just the wind, the two mana one one enchantment with flyers, uh, uninvited geists. I have two of those. The Three, three, uh, the one three, or no, the one one for for four that makes a zombie, and then you can give it the zombie's death touch, uh, and then the human rogue that flips, and you sacrifice a clue for two one. That's for curve filler, and then the uh, the seven mana five five that when it enters the battlefield you get something flying, and then when it's in your graveyard you can pay six to give all your guys flying. Um, I I also went with blue black in this build. Uh, it definitely seemed to me that. Blue Black, I think, had the best available options to it. Um, I interestingly enough, I think we were different by quite a few cards, actually. Yeah, um, yeah, we were. One thing is, I I, I don't really like Sanitarium Skeleton. Um, oh, I've been impressed with that card. Yeah, I it just doesn't seem like there's really that much of a payoff for it. Um, so I I actually played both Twins of Mauer Estate, Mauer Estate. Okay, the three drop. Yeah, the the Madness 3-5, um, because I do think you have a decent amount of Madness outlets in this deck. You have Macabre Waltz, you have sure. Pale Rider on turn 5, you have Elusive Tormentor, um, you have the Lamp the lamp Lighter, um, which I also agree I think is uh, better than it looks. Um, Ghostly Wings is also another reasonable Madness outlet. So I think you have enough ma- Madness outlets for you to be able to play the Twins. They're you know a pretty decent body, especially if you Madness them out. Um I I didn't have Daring Sleuth. There just there's no clues in the deck, so it's literally just like a two. Yeah, it was just a curve filler for me, so I could see not playing it. Yeah, um, in fact, I could just see playing even in my deck just the just the twins over that. Yeah, and like I said, I I have not really I, I don't know. Sanitarium Skeleton just feels way too low impact for what you're getting out of it. So sure, I just kind of went with I what I thought was like the solid twenty three cards. Um, that were available in that color combination. So, like, I played the second Lamplighter of Selhoff as well. Um, but, yeah, I, I definitely think blue-black, you get you get the the best available pool of commons and uncommons, as well as you get some decent rares in Elusive Tormentor. Um, and I don't think Moondrakes is great, but it's still a finisher. So. Yeah, I don't know how good it is either, but I have it in there. I mean, it's a finisher, right? Like it, 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 it will end a game for you. And if you can, if the game's stalling out at all, it's gonna do, do very well. And elusive tormentor, I think, is is basically a bomb. It's like, I had someone play that versus me in the pre-release, almost won that game off of my opponent misplaying and me having to runner runner two cards, mm-hmm. but still wasn't able to quite win because the card is just absurd. <laughs> Awesome. Well, that is it for this week, guys. We'll see you guys all in two weeks from this week. And uh, thank you, everyone, for listening. And have wonderful drafts and open some bombs. Catch you guys later.